it's a little bit, a little bit easier than last year, yeah. the Digital uh, Millennium Copyright Act. I was a, a freshman when we 
worked on it, and it made it illegal to circumvent digital rights management. It raised criminal penalties for online infringement, imposed a new regulatory scheme on internet uh, intermediaries, and that it was basically everything that the content people wanted from the Congress, uh, with the exception of the notice and takedown provisions that I had insisted on at the time and the reverse engineering provisions that I insisted on at the time. I, I think it's worth pointing out that at that time and to some extent to this day, the content people who have a legitimate uh, interest in protecting their content uh, are kind of oftentimes what I think of as white out on the screen people. Uh, they're really not thinking through the technology issues and that the first draft that I think was prepared by the industry actually would have had the effect of outlawing uh, web browsing. And I remember calling the then general counsel I got them in the, in the tech world then and to this day really is not well armed to lobby and be a presence in Washington compared to Hollywood and the other uh, long-term players. And I remember calling the general counsel at Yahoo then, a small startup, uh, saying, you know, you should pay attention to this because it could outlaw web browsing. And I had to call twice. And, and I thought, you know, this is the reverse. They're supposed to be calling me to lobby me. Um, but uh, anyhow, the bill was adopted. and But it really wasn't enough. Uh, in 2008, the industry then led by Hollywood, which because of broadband now has an increased concern about infringement of their uh, IP, asking Congress to pass the Pro-IP Act, which raised the statutory damages for infringement by an extreme amount, uh, created an IP czar in the White House uh, to coordinate enforcement and pushed all sorts of federal agencies to devote more uh, resources to uh, copyright infringement. Uh, in, the, in the interim, we adopted the Sonny Bono Copyright uh, Extension Act, which uh, basically uh, extends copyright for the life of the author plus seven years. So you're, you know, with our lifespan, you're talking a century and a half of, of protection, uh, which um, I think is not probably what the founders had in mind when they, uh, when they had uh, a brief period of protection to spur the, the, uh, the arts. So now we're at it again, and the Senate has what they call uh, the Pro-IP Act, um, which is, I hate the name, and they keep using the same names. Um, and, and, and as I, I think about what the content in industry is doing, I think they've sort of missed the boat in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think that the content industry have always been um, anxious about new technology. For example, when the player pianos came in, there was a belief that it would be the end of the music industry. And when radio came in, it was going to be the end of music. Um, and certainly, I remember Jack London, who was a, a marvelous person and a great hero and served in World War II. But saying that the, that the VCR would be the end of Hollywood. And, and, and so the, the, the attitude has been one of resistance to technological change, embracing the existing model, and, and thereby sometimes failing to take advantage of the cheap new technology that will actually uh, bring the content of industry new audiences. For example, if you want the CD, Hollywood thought the uh, DVD would destroy Hollywood. And in fact, a huge percentage of their business is, is up with DVDs. So I think actually the, the embracing of, of copyright protection has played some role in the content industry is not really thinking about how to utilize technology to their own benefit, to reach new audiences, and how to develop partnerships so that they can get paid. And if you contrast that with what for example, the retail industry did, not that that is a, a, an unblemished uh, uh, situation, but uh, by 2001, which is 10 years ago, Amazon had sales of $3.1 billion, and eBay had sales of $9.3 billion, and uh, they utilized technology to actually grow their business. So I think um, 
as, as we think about the monopoly that we have uh, created for copyright, uh, sanctioned by the, the Constitution, we also need to realize that that monopoly and the, and the eagerness for the content industry to enhance their monopoly has probably diverted them uh, from business opportunities that they, they might otherwise have been uh, exploring. But um, let's talk about what the uh, Pro-IP Act itself uh, would do. The bill would give the Attorney General the power to file a lawsuit accusing a website for being dedicated to infringing activities. And the government would have to prove one of two things. The website has no significant use other than engaging in, enabling, or facilitating copyright infringement. Or second, that the website is designed, operated, or marketed for copyright infringement and used primarily for that purpose. Well, I, uh, Bob, you're an evidence professor, so maybe we ought to have you come up here and talk about that. But I, I do think that they're already, with what ICE is doing, we've ended up in situations where you've got uh, infringing activities, but you also have free speech activities associated with it. This is going to be a very complex uh, issue. Uh, what Something that sounds simple will not actually be simple. Uh, if, if the government prevails, uh, here, here are the remedies, and here, here's where I think we have some additional uh, serious uh, problems. The court can order the website to cease and desist its operations, which is in many cases going to be a restraint on speech. And the government can get court orders that <coughs> also can be enforced on various innocent third parties uh, to shut the condemned website down. Now these uh, orders will be served on, on four categories of internet in intermediaries. Some I actually don't have a problem with, some I think are very problematic. The government can order a credit card companies and banks to stop transacting payments for the website. Uh, can order internet advertising agencies uh, to stop serving or displaying advertisements for the website. <coughs> Here's where we get into some severe problems. The government can order search engines to remove all hyperlinks to the <laughs> condemned site or otherwise remove or disable access and finally, the government can order internet service providers or anyone who operates a, quote, non-authoritative domain name system server in the United States to block the website uh, or its main server. Now, um, I mentioned the credit card issue because I do think, I mean, there are some sites where, I mean, there's massive theft of IP going on. Um, you know, I recently had a visit from a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, whose film uh, had been accessed, I mean, tens of thousands of times. She couldn't recoup her investment. It's not right, it's not legal, it's not fair. Um, and I talked to her about the need to follow the money. I mean, she has a right as the creator of this movie to be compensated for it. And I talked to her about what we've done with gambling uh, poker. I mean, there may be some online poker players here. I'm, believe me, I'm hearing from a lot of them. And Bob is shaking his head no. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's not legal in the United States. And recently there was an enforcement action on the online, uh, recently in the last several months, online poker. And the, uh, the domain names were taken down and they were instantly back up. I mean, that didn't do any good. But what really did uh, close this close it down was the, you couldn't process your credit cards uh, to play online poker, and so these sites went away. It's clearly if you follow the money, you're going to have the major impact, and you're going to avoid the collateral damage uh, to the internet that these um, provisions have. The, um, it's not gonna work to take these sites down you can, uh, you know, I, I talked to a, a songwriter the other day and I said, do you know how the internet works? And she said, well, I've been on the internet. Um, <laughs> you know, so I said, think about it as, as a phone book. You know, and if you, and if you tear the phone book up, are there still telephone numbers? Um, and she said, but she still wants to tear the phone book up. Um, we are going to have problems and, and I mean, it's not going to solve the problem because you, I've already downloaded the 
add-on to Firefox, the Mafia Fire, where you can redirect when, when the DNS has been uh, taken down. Uh, you can simply uh, switch your computer settings so that the DNS server is located out of the United States, which can't be ordered to comply with the order are utilized. Um, the DNS blocking won't stop piracy, but it can do a damage to the internet recently. And I, I have only one copy of it, but I probably should put it up on my, um, my website if the authors will permit me. Um, the DNS, five DNS and internet security experts have published a white paper entitled Security and Other Technical Concerns Raised by DNS Filtering Requirements in the Protect IP uh, Bill. And they explain how this act, if it were actually enacted, would undermine a key assumption of the domain name system, which is that each domain name has one true legitimate destination across the entire system, and under not, uh, how undermining this universality would have uh, a number of serious consequences. For example, it would undermine the implement implementation of the new DNS security extensions, which uh, are authentication technologies that are part of the new effort to enhance uh, cyber security that the government is promoting. DNS blocking would also encourage users to use alternative unregulated DNS servers, uh, which are more likely to be compromised. And in fact, there's a serious concern in some circles about uh, the exposure that we would have to uh, hacking by those uh, utilizing and relying on those sites. And uh, I, I just think, read the paper rather than me trying to tell you everything that's in it. But the DNS uh, blocking in the Protect IP Act actually goes farther than what uh, ICE is doing today. Uh, we have been seizing domain name websites, but uh, it's done by seizing the names directly through registries uh, located in the United States. This would put the US uh, in a filtering scheme, uh, which is sort of like what China is doing uh, now. And it's, I don't think we've ever done that. I know we've never done that. We haven't done that for crimes that most people would consider much more severe, uh, child pornog pornography, for example. There's tremendous concern among some that this uh, censorship that we would be engaging in, uh, like China, like Iran, would really undercut our ability to be the international good guys in terms of uh, free speech uh, and would under undercut the uh, global network uh, nature of uh, the internet. Now, um, the other thing, and I, I hesitate to say this because uh, there may be some who will look forward to this as a business opportunity, but it also creates a private right of action uh, to enforce the Pro-IP Act. And I have tremendous concern about that. Uh, you know, I was talking to some of, the, uh, some of you before we started who are patent lawyers, and I think uh, certainly there's been tremendous discussion of patent trolls, people who's, who are not, whose only business is extorting funds from <laughs> actual uh, creators. And certainly, to create a private right of action here, I, I can see that we will have copyright trolls uh, similar to the uh, patent trolls. And in fact, that's already <coughs> starting to happen, where uh, uh, the recording industry has, has granted uh, enforcement rights to some firms, and they are busily um, suing everyone in sight and extorting tremendous uh, payments by filing only in Washington, D.C., uh, where you know an individual user really doesn't have the capacity to go and defend himself or herself and, and is forced instead to pay a more nominal fee but still a significant uh, amount of money. So I think that that is a, uh, something that we ought to be wary of. I think that the... Um, the bill would really eliminate what's happening right now, which is some collaboration that's going on between content owners and intermediaries. I don't want to go into the details, but I do know that some of the big content owners are in very active discussion with Google and others. To see how can they collaborate to protect uh, intellectual property? And I think those efforts are good ones and are likely to result in a positive result uh, for um, internet uh, uh, content owners. I think that um, if I were going to worry about anybody in, in this whole scene, I think I would be uh, looking at uh, 
the entrenched interests who are actually providing internet access. When you take a look at what is the cable companies that are about to be disintegrated, I believe, uh, and, and internet provision of television and the like, that is a, it's going to be a very chaotic, disruptive situation, I think, for a number of years. Uh, and incumbents are going to face tremendous challenge. The, the one thing about the content industry is that there's only one Hollywood. And uh, we all love to see their movies. And although there are indies, I mean, because of the low uh, barrier to entry, there are probably more creators today than ever. Uh, but I don't think um, most of the YouTube uh, creators are going to displace Warner Brothers anytime uh, soon. So that is one thing. You know, the state of the net is uh, challenged by that legislation. And people say, well, that really won't happen, will it? I think at this point, I may be one of only a handful of members of the House who are in opposition of, uh, to this bill. The bill would pass the Senate um, handily, except for Ron Wyden, who is, uh, I've been in discussion with and has had a uh, strong objection to, uh, and has put a hold on it, as they can do in the Senate. So people who think, well, the, you know, the Congress would never do that, ought to understand that um, the content industries really have a tremendous uh, audience among the members of Congress and um, often, almost always, historically have gotten their way. I, um, I want to mention just one other thing, and then I'll get into your questions, and I'll also happily take suggestions. There is a bill that was marked up in the House Judiciary Com Committee. It's H.R. 1981. I remember the number because it really ought to be 1984. Um, it's called Protecting Children from Internet Pornography, Pornographers Act of 2000, uh, 2011. And at, basically, it would require uh, any provider of uh, in internet services for a fee to uh, acquire the name, credit history, and address of all users, retain that, the data, of all the uh, internet sites visited for a year and make that information available to the federal government without a warrant. Um, I actually, at the end, had an amendment that we, that we renamed the bill the, uh, I think it was keeping the digital information of every American for delivery to the federal government without a warrant act in 2011. <laughs> that actually got several votes. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you know, nobody is for internet child pornography. I mean, it's just it's horrendous things that have been done to children. Uh, I'm not generally for the death penalty. I could make an exception in some of these cases. Um, but that it has been utilized as cover, I think for a massive expansion of government power and intrusion into the personal uh, behavior of all Americans. This is not targeted to people who have committed a crime. If you have reason to believe that there is uh, criminality going on, I mean, you can go right now under the law and get uh, uh, retention of information by ISPs, and I think that's proper. Um, but this would basically, uh, you know, one of the, uh, reporters said it should be have your ISP spy on you in case you're a criminal act. Um, and I'm, I'm eager for the public to speak up about this because I think there are, uh, there are times when we're diverted by, and properly so, by big things that are happening in the world. We have a terrible economy. We have two wars that are still going on uh, and on and on and on. And meanwhile, there are these measures moving forward that I think would have a profound and adverse impact on the liberty interests of Americans. And uh, this is really something I think the FBI has wanted for a long time, uh, access to everybody's information. Uh, they want it for reasons they think is good. They're after criminals, and I, have, I don't uh, uh, disagree that they, they want to get the bad guys, but that's why we have a Fourth Amendment. It's why we have expectations of privacy, and it's really important not to be deterred by the name child pornography in, in, in the title of the bill. Uh, it, it passed out of the Judiciary Committee, and uh, I think it goes to the floor of the House, absent some public outcry, it passes uh, rather handily. So that's why I mentioned it uh, today. 
Uh, with that, I, I don't want to talk at you anymore. I prefer to have your questions or suggestions on uh, the topic of the internet or anything else that you have on your mind. So with that, how are we going to structure the questions? Uh, we have uh, Professor Goldman back here with the wireless microphone. <laughs> I, 
but I'm skeptical. I mean, the, the, the Tea Party people have disappointed me from time to time. I mean, they voted for the, the um, Child Pornography Act, even though you're saying, look, this isn't about child pornography. I mean, there have been times when you think, you know, where's the black helicopter caucus when we need them? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, on taxes, they've been firm. So I think, you know, I was very interested uh, that Amazon made the deal it did with the legislature because it only postpones the effect of the uh, state law and acknowledges it would be preempted by federal action, but I'm, I'm skeptical that we will get federal action. So I, and I'm sort of not sure why they did that. I, I, I assume that they could have put a ton of money uh, behind an initiative, and since it really does relate to California's paying a tax, uh, there might have been some residents on their side in an initiative. So, um, you know, I don't know, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. You didn't say early on that uh, Silicon Valley and the internet interests are not more engaged than they were in 1995. Uh, but what you said might have suggested it's not qualitatively more, and yet we hear about Google and Facebook and uh, Netflix having these huge uh, lobbying organizations that they put together very quickly. Have they not yet weighed in, or, or how does but that fit in? Certainly, with what you said? there is a presence, but if you <coughs> added up what every single internet company paid to put, you know, lobbyists on the ground, it wouldn't match what one phone company does. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm not critical. I mean, I understand that you've got people here, I mean, all the way from big guys like Google to little startup guys that are busy doing their business. I mean, inventing things and growing things and, and they don't want to go to Washington and deal with people who have no idea what the <laughs> internet is. I understand that. And you, but as a consequence, you end up with very poor decisions from time to time. I brought this because it was, it's an advertisement it was in um, Thursday's, one of the Hill Rags, uh, National Journal Daily. And it has, uh, it was, I don't know, the, it's fairsearch.org, squeeze. And it's got Adventures in Searchville, Google and Bob. And it says fair search squeeze. And it says, where's my business? Lemonade, 25 cents. And it shows, you know, the lemonade going into a free box. Ever wonder where Google gets its content? Does Google get its content? I, and Google's a search engine. They don't own content. I mean, um, is, and, and it shows, I mean, erroneously, that um, Google is stealing. It is really the upshot. Who did this? I think it, somebody told me it was Microsoft because they're in some fight over some extraneous thing. But the problem is that I have colleagues who, who think that um, the, the, the search actually is that the Google owns the content. They don't understand a search engine. And I mean, I'm not saying all members of Congress, that's certainly not the case, but if that's your level of understanding, you are for sure going to make very poor decisions on how to deal with this. And I think, uh, you know, how lobbying works is often misunderstood. It really is people coming in, making their case, uh, being heard, giving facts. If you come in and say something that's untrue, you better not come back. Um, you know, it's everybody from the PTA to universities to businesses, and the tech industry tends not to be present. And when they are present, they do so-called fly-ins, where, you know, execs walk around for a day and then go home. And so it's small wonder that they uh, generally uh, are not successful in the fight with the entrenched interests uh, who have learned how to do this, how, how to make their case more effectively. Is that a fair answer? That's a good one. <laughs> Question for you. Um, um, could you give your perspective about the government using its criminal authority and powers to, uh, in, in the SAT and the Oracle case, and do you see us as a sign of things to come? And just uh, what your views on it? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about the case, but my understanding is that in the civil case, the executives from SAP basically, under oath, uh, admitted that they stole 
they stole Oracle's code. I mean, and when you make that kind of admission under oath, and it is a crime, I don't think it's a surprise that the government is going to bring an action. Uh, and I don't think it's wrong to bring an action in such a case. I mean, I have problems with the overreach and the, and the collateral damage of some of these internet schemes. But I also believe uh, that if we have a copyright protection, people have a right to protect the stuff they created. I'm not opposed to copyright. I think the term is too long. Uh, but I'm not opposed to people protecting their creation. That's why we have copyright. And there's enforcement that's both civil and criminal. That's not wrong. I, I worry about the overreach um, more in, in what ICE is doing. And honestly, I was quite surprised to find that the Immigration and Customs Enforcement has now asserted primary jurisdiction over criminal enforcement in uh, internet um, copyright matters. And their theory is, is because the internet is international and they have customs enforcement, therefore ICE is the guy to go after um, infringing content on the internet. And some of the things that they've done, I mean, not just copyright, but also prosecutions, I mean, they took down uh, a website, a domain name of an alleged pornographer, and I think brought down, you know, 50,000 websites with them because they didn't know what they were doing, and put up little signs saying, close down for pornography purposes. I, I mean, I've talked to know, dentists who have their websites taken down, and it's like, can you imagine what the dental patients are thinking when they go and see that scandalous uh, material? So you know, there have been some missteps, and uh, you know, the argument I've made is, you know, it's a lot easier to make a case on infringing goods because you don't have a First Amendment issue than than content, and certainly there there's lots of. Um, fake pharmaceuticals, there's fake goods. Uh, most of the big, uh, you know, eBay, Google, uh, all of the big guys work very aggressively with the government to go after counterfeit stuff, as they should. I mean, and, and ICE has a role to play in that. And I think when they collaborate with the net world, they, they get a lot farther than just going stupidly on their own. Um, but when you get into speech things, you're going to run into problems, and you've already, you've already seen that. Yeah? Uh, actually, Congresswoman Ivan, if I, uh, can I follow up on Joseph's question there? The, the sheriff has been uh, an issue that um, between the Oracle update key litigation and the uh, Department of uh, Justice's um, uh, uh, criminal forfeiture deal with Google for a half a billion dollars, something interesting.
Hollywood has a point of view, and I, that's fine. I mean, but this is it's so owned and operated in terms of attitude, it was stunning, I thought. Um, and going through the demanding takedowns that ICE is doing right now without benefit of the Pro-IP Act, they believe they have the authority just because you can go in and, I mean, you can take, you know, one Ford truck uh, if it's an instrumentality of a crime, and they're using that general statute. I think, uh, I think that's pretty shaky, personally, but there's been very little, little litigation because um, you know, it's so much easier just to get a different domain name uh, than to spend all the time and money uh, you know, fighting this. And also, um, you know, some of the sites are in fact, I mean, outrageous infringers, so you know, they're not, shining a spotlight is not going to be a, 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 a favorable thing for them. Um, you know, I don't, all I know about the uh, Google matter is what I read in the paper, so I, I don't have any special information. It sounds like, uh, uh, from what I read, if it's true, that Google had, in fact, uh, failed in, in uh, their duty uh, and had stopped the practice a number of years ago um, and disgorged, disgorged all of the profits, which I think uh, uh, is fine. Um, I, 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 I wonder whether the um, the effort uh, is really to to spur Congress on to action. I think that the uh, the Pro IP Act has tremendous advocacy in the pro, in the IP czar's office. Uh, I don't think that the other agencies of the government that are concerned with elements of it, uh, in terms of the exposure to cyber security uh, problems have necessarily been heard within the government. And one of the things that I want to do, uh, I understand that the, that the engineers who wrote the white paper are now going to, you know, to Homeland Security and the Department of Defense saying, you know, here's a problem, guys, and try and get some interest beyond this one person whose sole focus is really uh, to protect Hollywood and the recording industry. Uh, I don't know what they're doing, but honestly, you know, when I look at who, what they've not done in terms of prosecutions for the uh, Wall Street bandits who took the uh, country over the edge, and then I see what they're doing in this area, I'd have to question their priorities. Thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Hansen. I'm teaching. Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm teaching, uh, I'm a senior researcher here, but I'm teaching also in, in Europe. Uh, and I'm maybe able to give you some tools against some of the legislation that you are fighting. Uh, as for the um, child pornography, um, US and a lot of European countries have signed the Cybercrime Convention, which has a statute on this issue. Uh, and as being a, a former uh, prosecutor, I would say that the thing that's really needed here is uh, the second part um, of the, this convention, which is the uh, cooperation between the uh, U.S. and the uh, European uh, and Interpol, I, I don't say that it doesn't work, but I think that is where the effort should be made. And at the same time, um, making a lot of U.S. legislation on this, if uh, it's fine, but if you cannot enforce, enforce it abroad, and uh, these guys that are doing this crime, uh, uh, child pornography, they will surely make the service or, or the whatever data they could outside the US. So um, it must be all an enforcement issue. Uh, and therefore, um, it might be uh, at least the first step to ju try to get on a level with what the cyber crime statute says. And the second thing is also with uh, all these questions about uh, taking down domain names and things like that. Um, European Union has actually talked about trying to get, uh, be sure that they can protect their citizens against all this US legislation where um, domain names are taken down, that they wanted to do something similar like China with a China wall. Uh, and secondly, uh, if they were uh, too amassed with um, all this domain, uh, they would, um, See, see to it that there is a domain server outside California law, which means ICANN is out, 
and Brazil and Europe, uh, European Union would, would, would probably make an alternative uh, domain system, then all the US legislation would be have no effect. Well, it's interesting uh, on your last point. Um, we, we had a hearing in the Intellectual Property Subcommittee that I, I am a member of about ICANN, and I mean, this is how odd the Congress is. The focus was um, ICANN's plan to expand um, the um, .xx, .whatever. And some of the um, content holders in America were upset because it, it, they were alleging that it would infringe their trademark. And the real issue to me is whether ICANN is going to survive as an international uh, entity, or whether, as you know, the Chinese have an interest in having the UN uh, take it over, and I think for a reason. Um, the, UN, the Chinese are able to control a lot of things uh, in the UN because of the extravagant um, uh, financial uh, entanglements they have with very small countries in various parts of the world. And I think their intent is, is basically to, to take over the internet. Uh, and, and the fight ought not to be about whether you know, some company is complaining that there might be a, an infringement, that the, the fight is to keep ICANN an international body that actually is for a free internet. And one of the things that they will do is to allow uh, country uh, level codes that are not controlled by repressive countries. I think that is a very important effort. And yet, it was something that you know, no one was interested in uh, on the committee because the sole focus is on content owners instead of the bigger picture. Um, I mean, that's my perspective. And it's something I said in, in the hearing, so uh, hopefully I'm not further insulting my colleagues. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in terms of uh, child pornography, I mean, it needs to be multifaceted and does need to be international. I'm interested in your comments, and I'll follow up in Washington on the collaboration between us and Interpol. There are some things that can be done more easily in terms of uh, technology with pornography than can be done with other types of activity. For example, uh, you can do screens in terms of, you know, there's flesh involved. I mean, there, you, there's the ability to do some screening, which in fact has happened um, with some of the uh, search engines and, and the like. But it is a fight, and I don't want to talk about the disgusting and horrible things that people are doing to small children, but it's, it's, it is the worst thing and uh, really deserves a, the most vi vigorous effort possible to, to stop. Uh, hi, I'm a student here. Um, recently it was discovered that some certificates have been forged or uh, broken, essentially. And I'm wondering if there might be a role for the United States government as essentially a repository for fully authenticated certificates that essentially can't be forged so that people can actually go to websites and actually have some confidence that they're actually visiting the site that is in fact what it claims to be. Well, it's interesting because I was a part of the Congress when we created ICON, and one of, one of the uh, discussions right before that, the internet was basically, uh, the whole system was run out of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And as the internet was taking off, we made the judgment that we were not going to, if we wanted to have a free internet, we couldn't make it, we couldn't control it out of the American government. There would not be credibility worldwide for that. And so the ICON was created, and all, I'm not saying that they haven't had occasional missteps or problems, but at least it did pretty much what we thought it would do. And I don't think that uh, a government certificate would be any more acceptable than than the Commerce Department running the internet. But I do think that um, if you can't have a system that is uh, reliable, basically you're gonna end up with a cannibalized internet too, which I think will have very adverse impacts on the economy of the world, not to mention uh, freedom. Well, the people who are probably going to be the authors are holding it close to the 
the best, they will tell me what's going to be in it. Um, what I think we should do is that we ought to look very carefully at follow the money schemes um, and, and forget taking down the domain names, forget monkeying around with the architecture of the internet, and, and simply develop a scheme that will prevent um, infringers from profiting. And uh, through the use of, uh, you know, everybody who's buying something in the United States, not everybody, but almost everybody, is using either a credit card or PayPal. And we can, I, we're not gonna get a fight uh, with PayPal or credit card companies by developing a scheme where infringers aren't paid. I mean, we can collaborate and make that work. Uh, I also think that when you look at advertising, there's gotta be a way to deny revenue to advertisers who are profiting from infringing. And you know, we all, as lawyers, we always look at the gray areas, but there are some things where it's not gray at all. I mean, where there's massive uh, copyright violations and people who, whose careers are being destroyed have every right to want to stop that. And we, and we ought to try to stop that, but we ought to do a follow the money scheme. And the rest of it I would simply not do. One of the reasons why I like doing it is because it's actually an efficient system. You, know, you talked about the DMCA and the takedown and Section 512, and that's one of the easiest systems to use. You simply submit a statement uh, under penalty of perjury basically saying, so and so is violating my copyrights in this software, please take them down, and send it to the ISP, send it to the content host, whoever, and then they have discretion to take it down which then gives the content provider time to go to court, get a TRO, get a preliminary injunction. And it's extremely easy to do, it's cost effective. So I guess my question or observation would be to the people pushing the Pro-IP Act, have they ever actually used the DMCA takedown? And if so, what's their problem with it? Well, that's a very good question. When we did the DMCA, one of the concerns I had, and it's proven, I think, not to be a huge problem, was that if the recipient of the notice and takedown notice doesn't have any um, in financial incentive to protect free speech. And so if you have somebody who's using the notice and takedown provision for a purpose that is not legitimate, basically to silence, that that would be a problem. From time to time, I mean, and, and the big search engines get this and they are wary of it. Uh, you know, that happens, but mainly this is a system that's worked. Um, I don't understand, I, you know, I get a lot, and I, need, I, I listen to everybody on the side. I don't just listen to the people who agree with my current position because I want to learn. And, and so uh, recently I said that I had some songwriters in and they were saying, there's piracy destroying the world. And I said, have you used the notice and take them? Well, no. Why? Because it would be too hard. It's like, well, too hard compared to, like, your life has been ruined? Um, and, you know, I don't know. Um, it is pretty simple. And uh, actually, the big tech companies have, you know, engines and tried to make it as simple as possible. And when it comes to, for example, well, I mean, use Google as an example, because we always use Google. I mean, they, they own YouTube. So, I mean, really, they're, they've got, uh, deals with artists if they're being infringed where they can actually track that and deal with it and uh, and they you know they'll respond and all all the companies will so I, I don't I think these are people who want the government to do their work for them and uh, you know to some extent when you have massive um, proliferating copyrights that are offshore it can be very burdensome and actually not even effective to do the notice and take down if your servers are offshore, which is why I think this follow the money approach merits our attention um, and will solve the problem. I'm glad to get feedback for what we did that actually worked. I think so we have time for a couple of more questions. Is okay. there, there any
I'm Richard Bennett with ITIF. We wrote a report about piracy litigation in December of 2009. And that outlined most of the strategies that are actually in the Protect ID Act, including the follow the money approach and cutting off the advertising. And I have to say, um, I've been a little disappointed by the reaction to Protect ID because, what I mean, we didn't write Protect, we didn't write the bill. Obviously, the Senate added some of their own students to it, it always happens. But what we were trying to do was to focus on a very narrow subset of the problem, which is the rogue sites that are actually collecting money by selling Hollywood content on the internet. And they're typically based overseas, so they would ignore the notice of daycare. And of course, the, I, I think probably the most controversial provision is the domain name stuff that we did. But that was actually not a unique idea. We didn't just sort of invent that out of thin air. I mean, it's actually based on an idea that Paul Dixie, one of the people who signed the engineer's letter, has proposed for dealing with sites that engage in fishing and other types of malicious behaviors, which is basically just a blacklist of sites that have been sort of known to be engaged primarily or exclusively in criminal activity. Now, assuming that we can sort of deal with some of the due process concerns, which I understand is going to crept in because of the way the bill was drafted, is that an approach that you, you could possibly support someday if it's tightened up a little bit? Well, I never say never, but I do have a concern about the DNS, uh, DNS filtering requirements and the, um, and the, and the takedown issue. As I think I've said throughout, I think cutting off the money, both through advertising and credit cards, is something I support and probably will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it did. Um, if, if you look at you know, the gambling industry, I'm not a big fan of gambling, but they are actually on the cutting edge of a lot of things. They had uh, encryption down before anybody else, uh, and you know, it's worked. The follow the money has worked more than the other aspects. I had forgotten about the paper. I should go back and review it. And if you'll send me a new copy, I will. But I, you know, so often we overreach, and and there's collateral damage. And I don't see any collateral damage if we follow the money. And I'm not, you know, few people in the Congress will say something that the content people aren't happy about. As you might imagine, they're not thrilled with what I say. <laughs> but I'm saying it because I think it's true. Um, and, and I'm not hostile to protecting the content owners. I mean, if you go, if you make a movie and spend a bunch of money and it, and it gets stolen, that's not a good, it's not fair to you, it's not legal, and it's not good for the country either. And, and I think we ought to do something about it, and I think we can do something about it. And the most effective thing we can do is to follow the money and cut it off. And I'm happy to participate. Yeah, I mean, we found that, that while the credit card companies are, are willing to cooperate, it can be a very difficult, it's sort of a whack-a-mole problem for them, too, because they have to know who's going to be processing the payments. And these companies that are selling content that they don't own are pretty good at finding different processors to sort of move the, move the query to. So that, what we found is that, that when you look at all the possible ways you can deal with not just copyright fraud on the internet, but just sort of crime in general. There's no real magic bullet. What we found is that you have to take sort of this multifaceted approach and you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And the, the blacklisting approach, I mean, Paul Dixie came up with that because they're leaving aside intellectual property concerns. There's a heck of a lot of criminal behavior, straight up criminal behavior on the internet. Sure there is. Well, I, you know, I'll look at your 2009 report, but the May 2011 mm. report, mm. also signed by Paul Dixie, says don't do it. And I think when you take a look at their paper, which I read with some interest, I think the, uh, the downsides far exceed whatever upsides you're going to get, especially if you have, I mean, this isn't easy. And there's not going to be, it's like, it's like hacking. Um, it's like cyber security threats are never going to go away. They're constantly going to move. And so if you're going to protect IP, you're going to have to constantly be, it's got to be active. It's got to be proactive. And I think that if we collaborate with, the, with PayPal and the credit card companies and 
there's been an expression. I mean, for example, Visa said they'll do no, they'll do it right now. And they have been asked, they told me three times in the last six months to do it. So I think to some extent, in this copyright arena, we've got content owners who are used to coming to Congress for solutions. And I think it would be a lot better if we were to get together and collaborate uh, on this with the financial institutions as well as the tech world, rather than have these battles in Congress that historically have not really yielded the results desired. I spoke with you earlier. I was, I'm a patent attorney as well, uh, named Neil Smith. I practice in the, in the Senate, um, here in the Senate. I uh, was concerned about some of the patent legislation that just passed at the Senate, and uh, whether there be some attempt to be able to cut back on some of that. I know there was some momentum to get that passed, uh, as well as the potential for uh, some of the money that would go to the Patent and Trademark Office for funding such things as a, uh, as a satellite office here in the Valley of uh, uh, being, uh, being tapped by Congress uh, to take care of the deficit and how we can protect against that. Well, the, the patent bill is something I worked on for more than 10 years. I mean, um, and I, I'll tell you, I was very disappointed at the outcome because as, as years went by, who else? Yes and no. I mean, the court has solved a lot of problems thanks to eBay for bringing the eBay case so that we don't have injunctive relief in, the, in every case. Uh, the courts have taken some uh, other issues and solved problems better than the Congress would. So the whole panoply of issues that we had to begin with wasn't still on the table by the time the bill was passed. Um, but it ended up being a rather weak bill. Um, it, you know, I was, I won't mention who, but I was on the floor managing uh, for the Democrats the night before the vote, and I got a text message from a uh, patent counsel and said, is there anything in here a Cole wouldn't like? They, I mean, there's nothing. They just didn't do anything. And further, um, the Senate had real anti-diversion, fee diversion language, which the House would not accept. So not only did we do very little, um, and there's a few things on post-grant review that may be of some value, um, but we didn't even prevent the, the diversion. And basically, uh, you know, it, there's a little bump in the road to taking the money, but it, there's, no, there's no real prohibition on taking the money. And, and to, to say, well, we'll never do it, we did it in February. We took $700 million out of the uh, patent office. And, you know, that, I believe that's likely to happen sometime in the future. And uh, I think it's wrong, but it's special tax on inventors. And we'll uh, keep the uh, office from modernizing it as it needs to be. I was very distressed that uh, in the Senate, the, there was a colloquy between uh, Senator Leahy and Senator Hatch uh, relating to a grace period and prior art protection. It's of real value to startups. And uh, there was a discussion in the House side to actually memorialize the um, colloquy into the statute. I mean, if you say we're for it, we actually should put it in the statute. Uh, I uh, raised kind of a dust up, and the chairman agreed that we would do that. And so we worked very hard with the uh, practitioners and law professors and the patent office to put a statute, you know, language that actually worked, which the chairman refused to accept. And so, you know, in the end, I voted against the bill, as did uh, Anna Eshoo, as did Mike Conda. And, I mean, the Silicon Valley representatives voted against the bill because it does almost nothing and may, in fact, do some harm to uh, startups and innovators. So uh, it's disappointing to spend more than a decade on something that, in the end, disintegrates. But there you have it, service in the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Right. The Commerce Department has uh, started a new initiative called National Strategy for Trusted Identity from Cyberspace for catalyzing the private sector to do something uh, about improving experience and capabilities of internet identity. I wonder if you've looked at that 
I'm not uh, an expert in it. Um, I, I do understand that there's concern um, about the uh, domain name diversion issue relative to the competing effort to assure internet users that they are in fact going where they need to go and we're moving in different directions uh, on this. But um, I'm sure that my colleague Anna Eschen, who serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, they'll have more jurisdiction over that than, than the Judiciary Committee and she's a terrific representative and we'll work together. With that, I'm going to thank you very much for spending the morning.